I'm Richard Doty. Um, I was assigned as a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations at Kirtland Air Force Base. I was a counterintelligence officer at the base, and one of my jobs uh, was to conduct counterintelligence operations uh, at the base. And uh, during my time there, my first few months there, I was briefed into a special access program involving the U U.S. government's uh, investigation and contacts with extraterrestrial, the visitation of these extraterrestrials to, to, uh, to Earth, and the, U the Air Force's involvement with these, with these uh, extraterrestrials. And during this time, I conducted investigations regarding uh, uh, not, not just the UFO, UFO phenomena, but uh, uh, my primary mission, I probably 60% of my time was dealt to that, dealt in, uh, to investigating uh, the uh, UFO sightings and any threats imposed uh, by these extraterrestrials on Air Force or Air Force related property. Right. What year did you first get read into the project? I was read in project, uh, into the project in the summer of 1979. Okay. And, and, and the, the briefing was, uh, it was a, a special access program. I uh, have a special security clearance to have access to it. And it was briefed, I was briefed into it by an Air Force colonel uh, from Washington who came down and briefed myself and a couple other people into this program. And do you remember if it had a code name or a project code number? Yeah, the, the, it w was the, the initial, um, how do I say this? Because uh, there's still some uh, classifications involved in this, sure. I think. So uh, it was... Uh, the code name that I was briefed into it was Yankee Black, uh, but that was the program's briefing. It wasn't necessarily the UFO's program. It was just how it was a security, actually a security code for an access program. Uh, Yankee White was uh, access to the, to the White House, and Yankee Black was the access that you would have to have to get into this program or right into the program. And what, what were you told during this briefing, and do you even recall the colonel's name? Um, I'll leave the colonel's name out of it, but uh, the, the briefing started with a history, US, U.S.'s involvement with the, uh, this extraterrestrial, and it, and it started out with a crash at Roswell. But uh, actually, what the, the crash didn't actually happen at Roswell happened uh, closer to Corona, New Mexico, uh, south, southeast, uh, southwest of Corona, New Mexico. And a second uh, crash site that occurred uh, in uh, Magdalena or Horse Mesa out west of, of Magdalena, New Mexico, uh, which wasn't located uh, at the same time the Roswell crash was in 47. The crash in Magdalena wasn't uh, located until about 49. And did they share with you what they found during that investigation and recovery? They showed us a uh, the movie. They actually showed us, a, I believe, a 16 millimeter movie on the recovery. And um, the narrator of the movie, uh, it was obviously the movie was classified, highly classified. The narrator of the movie uh, detailed uh, when the crash occurred, approximately when the crash occurred in in, in the uh, latter part of June of 1947. And, a, and, and the recovery, uh, showing uh, military personnel at the recovery site, uh, uh, disc, uh, recovering the bodies at the site, and the uh, craft that was at that site. And uh, one live uh, extraterrestrial was, was found at the site. And, um, and we were told that the extraterrestrial went to um, Kirtland Field, Kirtland Air Force Base uh, at that time, and then on to Los Alamos for some time. And um, it didn't explain fully in the movie exactly what happened to that, that extraterrestrial, although it did explain that it died in, in I believe it was 1952. But the, the bodies of the, uh, the extraterrestrials that were found at the scene were in a deep freeze, placed in a deep freeze, and sent to Wright Pat Field in uh, Dayton, Ohio. 
Did they show the actual footage of the craft and bodies? And yes. So what did it look like? What did they look like? Now the craft is wasn't it was more or less an oval egg shaped craft. It wasn't uh, saucer shaped. Mm -hmm. uh, the creatures were about uh, four foot. Uh, some of the creatures were were, were uh, uh, mangled, uh, were heavily uh, injured, and their bodies were were torn apart. But uh, two of the bodies were pretty much intact, and and I'm not sure how why if there was an autopsy they didn't discuss that but the creatures were uh, approximately four foot they had uh, didn't appear to have any ears they had an indentation for nose very very big eyes they had a really tight fitting uh, suit almost looked like they were uh, nude but they actually uh, had a very thin but tight fitting suit on uh, the um, the fingers had no thumbs just four four fingers suction devices on their tips of their fingers and um, and um, one of them had a, a, a head apparatus on him on it uh, uh, maybe maybe a helmet or a, some kind of an earphone or some some type of um, a device that was they were communicating with with the craft or with with something else uh, <clears throat> and they found uh, a number of different objects in the craft that they used, uh, th they experimented with and found. Uh, they had a, a piece of, they thought with plexiglass, it was a square piece, a rectangle piece of, of plexiglass that they had, uh, they kept for years before they figured out it was an en the, the energy device for the, uh, the craft. And um, then they showed us the recovery of, of the craft in 1949 in Horse Mesa. And that craft, uh, it crashed at the same time the 47 craft crashed. But because of the remoteness of that location, it w wasn't detected until a, a rancher found it on his property in, in, uh, in 49. And they did a recovery op a, a project on that craft, but the bodies were, were decayed. Uh, and uh, there wasn't much left of the body, but the craft was... Uh, the same type of craft that was found near Corona. It was an oval-shaped craft, and, but it had damage to it, just like the one that uh, uh, Corona did. And I think they, uh, their opi the opinion of the scientists were the two crafts crashed for some reason, which uh, was never explained. No, I think nobody has it right. One of the things, one one of the things that um, yeah. is is quite uh, disgusting, if you if you, for the people who've ever been briefed in this program, is there's not much out there that's actual factual. Uh, the UFO community uh, disinforms themselves. They provide people go out there and write books, and without any facts, <clears throat> uh, ninety percent of everybody that writes these books, these authors had never been in the military, never been, worked for the intelligence community, never had a security clearance, and they're just relying on second, third, and fourth hand information to write a book and then po basically poison the, the, their readers and the rest of the UFO community. Uh, and so the, the, 40, the, the July craft actually, uh, it, it crashed in, in, in uh, the end of June uh, the recovery pro project was into into July, because it was at the end of June, and uh, and and people just didn't, didn't get it right, and the UFO community didn't get it right. Now there's some people out there uh, that that have tried to present the facts, but they've been ridiculed and, uh, and, and 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 so their information is not being believed. But uh, just like the Horse Mesa crash. In '49, very few people have that fa factual. They think it was an entirely different craft. The, the the craft was exactly the same as the Corona craft, exactly the same. And the damages that they showed in this in this movie, they showed scre ske sketches of the crafts together at some location, and it ap appeared if, if anybody with a logical mind can see that these crafts crashed together. Uh, why they craft, uh, crashed, I, I believe the, 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 the Eben, they called it, the, the, this uh, particular entity that w lived in Eben, uh, he probably explained 
but uh, I was never briefed into exactly what he, how he explained that the two crafts crashed. It was a, I know it was a lightning storm. It was a, it was a storm in, in that time period of where, when it was cra when they craft, crashed. Uh, but the, uh, the two crashes have been separated by some people and then discounted by others within the UFO community. And that's what is so disgusting and troubling within the UFO community. That's why I have nothing to do with them anymore. I've tried. I've, I've went to UFO conventions and tried to explain what the, what the truth is, and nobody wants to hear you because they've written a book that says it happened this way, and they're not going to listen to you, even though they don't, don't, really don't know the truth. Right. Don't bother me with the facts my mind is made of. Exactly. Yeah, I run into it all the time. Yeah. So did the craft, can you describe the, the actual craft more? Did they show enough of it to get any detail of the sense of the yeah, size? It, and yeah, it's, it's a, it was about uh, 35 foot in diameter uh, across. I mean, uh, uh, 35 by, I think, 42 or something like that. Uh, the interior craft was, uh, it, it didn't have any actual levers uh, or flight control systems that we would identify as a flight control system or avionics that we would identify as flight avionics at totally unknown uh, uh, devices in the craft uh, the steering mechanisms um, but they eventually I think over some time figured it out and it was done all by hands uh, the, 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 the creatures would put their hands on controls and they'd have this headset on and this headset would somehow control or, or help them control the aircraft. And the avionics were very, very sophisticated avionics uh, that uh, it took us years, I think, to figure it out. And I was never briefed into that, so I can't, I can't talk. I don't know anything about the, what they figured out. But they took the crafts to Wright-Patterson, and at the time, in the late 40s, that was probably the best place to understand uh, or try to figure out. They had the best scientists there to figure out uh, how, how these crafts flew. Did uh, the, ener the energy device, you said kind of like plexiglass or translucent, some sort of translucent object, did you ever get uh, read into any of the modus operandi of that or how did they figure out how that worked? I was uh, not directly briefed in, but at some time in my career, uh, I read a document uh, in, in Washington that explained uh, the the U.S. is under or U.S. scientists is understanding of what this was it was an energy device that uh, that used a zero point energy. That's what they referred it to as zero point energy, and it was connected in such a manner that this device could power. I mean, from a, a very small uh, fl flashlight or a very small watch up to a city, and and the uh, uh, power was determined by what the demand on it was. And so each craft had one of these. Uh, the, cra the, the craft that crashed in, uh, in Magdalena, or in Horace Mesa out west, had a, a larger uh, energy device than the one found in Corona. And they don't, I don't think they under could understand why, but it operated in the same manner. Okay. And did they... Figure out how to apply that into other research projects. Did you, did you find out if this was then studied and put into experimental U.S. Uh, prototypes? I was never briefed in, in in that program. I'm sure they did, but I can't I, I can't talk about that because I I can only talk about what I've done and what right, I've seen. Exactly. But That's I, all I want. Yeah, I I, I I was never briefed into that. Got it. Got it. So after this uh, uh, briefing, was there anything else in the briefing that stood out from the colonel who? Uh, the briefing pertained to the threat posed, uh, the, the threat that was imposed by extraterrestrial crafts, and, the, and then also briefed on some other uh, alien uh, crafts that had visited Earth. There was uh, four types of crafts that they showed us, four types of extraterrestrials, and they never explained to us where they got the pictures of these extraterrestrials. But we at, there were actually pictures of these weird-looking creatures that, that showed on the film that were extraterrestrials from, from some other location different from where the Ebens came from. And one was looking like an insect, had huge eyes, mm -hmm. very large head, a small body, 
uh, they had two different appendages on their, their arms. They had basically two hands on each arm. Mm -hmm. And um, they had uh, several joints in their, in their legs. And they had a, a bubble uh, type appendage in the front and, and, a, and a lump or something in the back. And um, that was one of them. And the other one was you a, know how bit large those uh, they, they were about they were about the size of a human uh, average human, about five, probably between five foot and six foot tall. And the, the second one was a very tall, thin, very, uh, very thin uh, uh, humanoid uh, that had long arms, the arms reached down uh, f probably to the to its knees or, or halfway between their, their, their hips and, and, their, and their feet. Uh, they had regular hands. Uh, their faces were very, very thin. They were almost human looking, mm -hmm. unless you really, really studied them, we got real close to them, and then you determined they weren't human. I mean, you, you couldn't identify them as human hair. beings. They, they didn't have any hair. They had um, a cat like eyes. Their, their, their uh, uh, irises were different than that of a human, almost cat like. Mm -hmm. And then there was a third creature that was a. Uh, uh, as I, was, I found this out later, but at the time, it, they just showed the creature, and it, it looked something like the Eben, but it was uh, bigger. It had a, had a, a, a bigger body. Than, but, but I found out later in a, in a briefing I had in 1985 that that was a genetically engineered uh, uh, a, a creature that the Ebens made. And, um, and that was a briefing in, in, in 85 based on an investigation that we were doing. They thought it was genetically engineered? They, they, they knew it was genetically engineered, and I don't know how. They didn't ever tell, to tell us how, but did they... Did they read you into the neural complex with integrated circuits and no, neural... No, okay. no, no. Um, did, did, were there any uh, craft associated with these other species? Yes, yeah, and yeah. What did those look like? One was a cigar-shaped craft. Mm -hmm. One was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a, I, I don't, I, I think it was like, 60 or 70 feet long and, and 20 or 30 feet wide, scar shape. Uh, second one was a, a, a regular saucer shape, but it was really, really wide. It almost looked like a, one of those um, uh, tops that the kids play with. R really, really wide. And, and um, they were puzzled. I remember in the briefing, in the initial briefing, the colonel said, we still can't figure out how this thing flies. So uh, they pictured it, they took pictures of it, they saw it, and, but I don't know that they ever actually captured one. Uh, at least at that point, I didn't know, and, and they never told us that. And then there was another craft that was very, very small. It was about the size of a Volkswagen, and, but it was, I mean, a saucer shape, but it was, I mean, excuse me, oval shape, almost like the Eben, but a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. It was almost like it was a one-seater, a one-seater uh, uh, type of maybe an observation or a reconnaissance craft. And those are the only crafts that I, I that they briefed us uh, that that was in a presentation. And those, there you, had, you saw photos of those. Yeah, they had photos of them actually in the film. They showed photos in the film of of these creatures. I mean, of these crafts. And the film started. Uh, you could tell that the film was an old film when it started, maybe in the fifties or early fifties or late forties. Didn't have a date on it. But then, as the film went, as the uh, briefing went on. It got more modern. I mean, the information in it became more modern, and you could see, uh, based on what was shown in in, in the movie, uh, that it was a the information was was uh, uh, more current than the first part of the film was, and uh, the pictures of these crafts that we saw in the latter part of and this the, the crafts were in the latter part of the film was something that I've seen since on on TV on, on the History Channel that. That, that, that other people have taken, like the McMinnville craft. Uh, one of the crafts in there looked just exactly like, if, if you're familiar with it, Mc, Mc, yes. I think that was in 51 or 50 or something, right. back in the 50s. Right. Did the, uh, the colonel, or during this briefing and subsequent briefing, did they ever explain to you what the perceived threat was that they were concerned about? Uh, yes, the threat to, uh, number one, the first uh, uh, perceived threat was, uh, what were they after? Uh, what was it a reconnaissance? Were these a reconnaissance flight? Were they going to uh, recon before an invasion? 
uh, it was were they going to uh, uh, land and, and, and take over some particular facility for their own purpose? Uh, were they short of minerals? Because a lot of it, a lot of what we were told towards the end of the film was that a lot of these crafts later on were seen over um, uranium mines and uh, and, and other faci- uh, mining areas, and so they're concerned: what are they after? Are they after uranium or turn into plutonium or, or or exactly what they're after? And so our job was to investigate, you know, sure. if, and determine was there a was there a threat, and and if there was a threat, report it up the chain of command and. And hope it I wasn't would say a big it threat. Sounds like from their technologies, they've gone a little bit past uh, nuclear power. But, uh, uh, but the, was there any sense that the, the advent of all these of these uh, occurrences had to do with the fact that we had developed atomic weapons? Because Roswell, of course, had the atomic bomb squadron, the only one in the world at the time, and uh, this facility here, and uranium mines, and et cetera. It, it, Colonel Diedrichson, as you know, is one of the disclosure projects, said that every single one of our facilities had, had reconnaissance of, and it was that discussed? Um, well, they, they inferred it, that, the, um, that they were concerned, because the way they would Colonel put it, and I think this was some of his own feelings at the time when he, when he talked to us later, uh, was that you know we just had a we just had a, a drop two bombs nuclear weapons on a country uh, we had a test of that bomb a few months earlier or a few weeks earlier in New Mexico and this probably was observed by these aliens somewhere whether they were doing reconnaissance back then or how they had figured it out so they came here to to observe and try to figure out what the heck was that and maybe they didn't have a weapon like that. And maybe they did, and maybe they're concerned about this Earth for some particular reason, and or maybe they were after those weapons, and and that was a concern because security of nuclear weapons was the number one priority uh, of, of of the United States Air Force because Air Force had a lot of nuclear weapons. One of the primary missions for OSI was protect uh, counterintelligence uh, operations against the threat of nuclear weapons, and. And Kirtland Air Force Base had a lot of nuclear weapons. And New Mexico had, at the time, like you said, the 509th Bomb Wing at Roswell had the only nuclear-capable uh, strike force in the United States at that time. That's right. Yeah. Right. So uh, in, were there subsequent briefings but from the 79 and 80, 1985 ones? Were, were, were there further updates during your career? Um, when, when, we, when we were investigating something... Uh, we then asked for a briefing on it because we didn't get everything. Um, we were we were we were given enough to conduct an investigation, have some historical knowledge on what we were investigating. But then when we we at, at, in in eighty one, I believe it was nineteen eighty one, there was a uh, a scientist uh, who died, a scientist, an Air Force scientist, who passed away, and he had a. A, an old army footlocker full of autopsy photographs. And these autopsy photographs were of, of the uh, creatures that died at, in the corona crash. And so we went out to recover all this stuff. And I looked at these things, and it didn't look like humans to me. I, you know, I, I looked at this, and these were actual, you being a doctor, you understand, autopsy photographs. And they were you know, still photographs of autopsies. But they had the organs out. And, and I had a little bit of medical knowledge, not a whole lot, but I had a little bit of medical knowledge and looked at this and I said, it doesn't look like a heart or it doesn't look like a lung. But what we found out was, and true, that these Ebens had just one organ that was made up of the heart and lungs. It was just one organ. And they had a couple different stomachs for different uh, digestive uh, reasons. And they had a, 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 an organ that that would take every single bit of moisture out of it, whatever they ate and, 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 and fed the body. So they didn't really have to eat, eat, drink a lot of fluids. And when, when I found all this stuff, I took it in, I, I immediately classified it. Uh, I asked for a briefing. Well, what is this? Is this human or not? Well, the, 
on the bottom of each photograph, there was a case number and a date. And the dates were in, in the 40s, 47. It was, I think there was September something of 47. And the case wasn't a case number that I recognized. So then I asked, and eventually I got a briefing by a, 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 a scientist who was a medical doctor. He was out, he was from the uh, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, D.C. He came out, and myself and the other agents that were involved in this, he briefed us. He, he, he gave us basically anatomy 101 of, a, of an extraterrestrial. And he said, yeah, in fact, these are the uh, autopsy photographs from Corona. And did he, uh, did they have any further details that they provided them? You can, maybe the brain or any other organs? Yeah, the brain, yeah, the brain had, a, had I, I, don't rem I don't remember how many lobes the human brains have, but they, they, they had 11 different lobes of their brain. And they had where the, their spinal cord met the brain, uh, it was, had a, a two little bulbs on each side which they could never figure out what they were. It wasn't like ours. Uh, and, and their eyes were very sophisticated. They had, they had the optic nerves, but the optic nerves go, went into different places in the brain, almost as if the brain was operating, their eyes were operating at different parts of the brain for, for some particular reason. Fascinating. Yes. And were there any reproductive organs, or did they get a sense of? They they didn't find. I, no, I wasn't briefed on anything like that. And I don't. None of them were females, so mm -hmm. they they they. I think the even even once told them that there were females, mm -hmm. but there wasn't any females on any of these crafts. They were all male. Yeah, they were all males. Did they have penises? Or? Yeah, they did. They had a reproductive gland. Okay. They call, they didn't call it a penis. They call it a reproductive gland. Okay. It was in the body. Uh, and I guess at the time of, you know, it came out. Uh, that's what they figured. Their muscles were extremely fibrous. I remember that, especially the leg muscles. Uh, they weren't bulky, but they were strong. They, they were fibered, uh, which I guess gave them more strength than what our muscles. Um, they didn't have ears, but they had a canal with a with a uh, uh, an organ or gland, like I think they call it, a little bulb, that that they think was what they they could hear out of, but they didn't have vocal cords like we had. The vocal cord they didn't have any. So uh, this another thing that was bred in in the briefing was very fascinating to me. When this creature was found, he couldn't communicate other than hand signals. So when he was taken in. Uh, to Los Alamos, to a medical facility at Los Alamos, uh, and examined. Of course, the physicians didn't know what they were examining. They figured out, they eventually were able to communicate through sign language. And eventually, somehow, somebody figured out how to uh, do an operation on the vocal cord or, or insert something in there so it could talk, it could, so it could make sounds. And... Uh, and, and I, I don't know how that, I don't know how they did that. Did they, uh, did this living ET um, share how they communicated with each other? As uh, through, I guess, well, I wasn't directly ever briefed on that, but I found out some, some years later that they did it telepathy, te te telepathically. Right. Were there any humans that became adept at doing that with them? Yes, there was a, uh, the handler, this, um, the Eben that lived, the Eben one, uh, he had an Air Force uh, captain that was assigned to him. And the captain was a linguist, spoke, I don't know how many different languages, but he was also an intelligence officer. And he was able to uh, build a really good rapport with the Eben and was able to communicate uh, far more communications than anyone else could. And he actually lived with this Eben for, I think the three or four years until it died. Do you know the names of any of the other agencies or um, project code numbers or code names that were associated with this subject back in that era? A DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, was intimately involved in it. Everything that we sent up ended up, everything we sent up through OSI headquarters went to DIA. Okay. And um, 
uh, there was a guy by the name of uh, Tom Mack. Tom Mack was a project manager for in DIA for for this project. Um, the projects had various names, uh, and some some of the names are just uh, phonetic a phonetic name like Quebec. Uh, phonetic uh, alphabet, military phonetical al- alphabet. The Q, you would say, if you were talking over the radio, Quebec, Q for Quebec. And so we would use phonetic for a particular operation with a, a, a district, a number, one of our district numbers, and then a case, a case, a progressive number, we call it, after that. So you might have a Q17, which District 17 was OSI at, at Kirtland, and then a number, a progressive number for the case number. And but but if I if you went to Pease Air Force Base, I went out to Pease Air Force Base, uh, in which is no longer there, but it's in northern uh, New York, is a SAC base, Strategic Air Command and Base. They had a, a very peculiar incident happen up there uh, of a, a UFO that was flying around their nuclear weapon storage area. It actually landed, and a and a weapon had been taken apart. It, it, not the the warhead wasn't stolen, but it, somehow. It was taken apart, and there wasn't anybody in this bunker to do that. So they figured, how the heck this happened? So they thought maybe it was a Russian operation or something. And so we went up there, and uh, and and during this briefing, uh, I mean during this operation, um, we found um, prints, fingerprints, but they weren't like our fingerprints. They were very strange-looking uh, uh, prints. Now. If, remember when I told you about one of the creatures had two, two hands on one arm, one appendage? They, it appeared that something like that had gotten in there. Somehow it got in it, and it, nobody could figure it out because it's a very secure area. You, you could figure it Nuclear weapon storage is very secure. But they had fingerprints. So now we have fingerprints, and that was the first time that we, as, as a government, actually got extraterrestrial fingerprints. Do you remember what year that was? That was in uh, 84. That was 1984. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, well, it was winter times. So I don't remember if it was late winter, early winter, of, of, uh, because it was snow on the ground. Of course, upstate New York, it's, it's uh, pretty bad. But um, that, I thought that was fascinating. But never, we never could, could figure out anything other than that it got in and it, it, it took, took fingerprints. Now, there were many, many, many cases of, of, extra, of a UFO spotted around nuclear weapons facility, launch control facilities, uh, Ellsworth Air Force Base, uh, Maelstrom Air Force Base, uh, and then SAC bases that had nuclear weapons. Yes, Wordsmith, yes, yeah, strategic air command bases. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, Colonel Dietrichson said virtually every facility. Yeah. Had yeah. yeah. Yeah, I read a report where almost virtually everything was, uh, but some of them were more. Uh, intrusive than just the security forces seeing something flying around compared to creatures seeing, found inside a, 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 an area. Uh, and we had that at Kirtland in 1980, where um, security police at Manzano uh, complex, which was where the nuclear weapons were stored, saw these strange lights out at Coyote Canyon, which was east of the of the complex, the nuclear weapons complex, and something landed. And so I conducted that investigation, which was extensive investigation, which uh, led into the Paul Benowitz incident. Yeah, what was that all about? What, what, what actually happened with that? Paul Benowitz yeah. or the? Well, both. Okay. Both. The, I've seen some of the documents about the Coyote Canyon event and also an earlier one uh, or around that time where uh, one of your security officers saw a disk Right. Out on the. Actually, one of the security officers from Sandia Laboratories, they had their own security, was checking, it was driving around on a graveyard shift sometime after two o'clock in the morning and saw a craft land at a, at a uh, bunker. But the, the bunker didn't have anything in it, but the craft landed. And when it landed, all the electronics in the vehicle shut off, his engine shut off. His portable radio stopped 
transmitting its portable radio in the vehicle stop for, for as long as that craft was on the ground. When the craft took off, everything came back on. And so I investigated that. Um, all, all we found was that something landed there. Was on base radar? Uh, no radar. There, I checked it. F, the first thing I did was check with FAA. <clears throat> and we had also at Kirtland, we had a, uh, at that point it was, at that time it was pretty uh, a secretive unit that uh, scanned every single frequency that was, could possibly be generated in and around the base, radio frequencies. And so I went to them and I said, hey, did you guys pick up any strange frequencies on this particular time frame? Nope. I said, okay, I went to FAA. Let me see your, your printouts for this night. Nothing. So then I thought, well, are these guys making this up or what? Well, then the security police inside Manzano, I interviewed them separately and they told me the exact same story. So I thought, it's too, it's just, makes too much sense to be be a, a fantasy or hoaxing. So uh, we investigated, but we could never find anything regarding that craft. But shortly after that, Major Ernie Edwards, who was the commander of the 1608 Security Police Squadron, the, the, the security Air Force Security Police that guarded Monsanto, came to me and said, I got a phone call from a guy by the name of Paul Benowitz. He, he lives right outside the base. He lives in Four Hills, which is a housing community just on the other side of, of the base, perimeter. And he told me he start, he's seen all sorts of strange lights around Manzano. So I said, oh, that's strange. And so I started checking into it, and we found out that Paul Benowitz owned a, 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 a business right outside the main gate of, of Kirtland, uh, Thunder Scientific Laboratories. They made humidity sensors for submarines. So he had a government contract, and he had security clearance. So I went and paid him a visit, asked him about what he saw, and he started telling me all sorts of stories about what he saw and what he did and what he thinks they are. So we conducted an investigation just to make sure this guy wasn't a Russian spy, he wasn't you know, doing all these things. He, his house was literally just a few feet from the base perimeter. I mean, his backyard bucked right up to the, to the, the base perimeter. And he had all this sophisticated, now he was, a, he was a physicist. He had all this sophisticated equipment on his patio, his, his upper bedroom patio, that was pointed towards the base. And that's what we were concerned about. So we conducted an investigation on him, not only us, but National Security Agency, because he actually tapped in, and this was classified at one time, I don't believe it is class anymore, classified anymore. He was tapped in to a, National Security Agency, an NSA project that was going on on base, and which he shouldn't have been able to figure it out, but he did. Very smart guy. So we had to figure out how we're going to get him away from what he was doing. And so we started slowly convincing him, or, or not really convincing him, but just giving him the idea that this might be just UFOs, extraterrestrials. And he ran with that. And I know I had a lot of criticism about that I fed him all this disinformation and I made him go crazy, but Paul thought a lot of this up on his own. I didn't have to, it wasn't very difficult for me to convince him what he was seeing. He just, he just told me, it's UFOs. Years later, I became friends with him. Years later, after I got out, he still owned it. I tried to explain to him that what he saw wasn't, but he would never believe me. He eventually, it went crazy and, and he died some, some years later. But some of what he was seeing was uh, he took pictures of strange looking lights and orbs. And in fact, I sat, and not just me, Jerry Miller, who was a, uh, uh, he had been a Project Blue Book investigator some years before and he was in, 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 he was in the intelligence uh, staff at Kirtland, uh, not with OSI, but with another agency. Him and I sat in a room, uh, probably not any uh, bigger than this, with really tall ceilings. And, and Paul was sitting, and, and we just had dinner, and we came in, and we had some coffee, and the lights were down. Uh, in fact, none of the ceiling lights were on. We had just some table lights on. 
And we were talking. It was, it was 8 or 9 o'clock at night in a winter night. And he says, he was explaining to us what he was seeing. And all of a sudden, we see this orb up in the corner of his room. And I looked at it and I watched it. Nobody else saw it at first. And I kind of elbowed. There was three of us there. It was me, uh, Jerry, and, and another agent by the name of Steve Atzett. And I hit, and, 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 and Jerry looked up and he said, and we didn't say anything to Paul. And I started flying around the room, and then, of course, Paul saw it. He said, well, there it is. We looked around like, what the heck is this thing, you know? And uh, so we watched it for maybe 20 seconds, and it disappeared. It went right back to that spot. Well, Jerry thought that it was created by Paul. And, and, and Jerry confronted him. He said, Paul, what did you just do? I said, no, I didn't do anything. He said, can I look and can I check things out? Yeah, go ahead. Well, Jerry looked, Jerry's a scientist too. He looked all over, went up to his room, looked all, couldn't find anything that could have generated something like this. It was a ball of light with like little sparklers around it. And he says, that's the aliens. That's their, that's their uh, 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 reconnaissance. That's how they keep an eye on me. And uh, a few weeks later, um, we were in his house without him being there. Now, a lot of people are saying we broke in, we stripped his entry. He gave me the key. Paul gave me the key, told me to keep my eye on. If you ever want to go in there, here's the key. So we didn't get any search warrants or anything, but we went in there, and we saw a, a real small orb, not the same size we saw earlier, real small orb that burned a hole through through his ceiling, I mean, through his wall, from one room to another. And when we came back a couple of weeks later, we told him about it, and that burn hole was still there. Oh. So at first, we thought Paul was just hallucinating, you know. But the more I looked into this, there was something to this. They were, they were he was actually photographing uh, extraterrestrials. Not so many, not so much of a creature or a, uh, but, but of their, their reconnaissance or, or their small uh, orbs that they used to, to conduct uh, experiments on humans. And uh, he had, uh, I don't remember how many, but he had a whole group of pictures that he had, I told him, the next time you take any pictures with your, he had a Canon 35 millimeter, one of those, well, at that time it was new. He had a Canon 35 millimeter, and I told him, I said, if you ever take any pictures of UFOs, don't develop them. Let us do it. And he said, okay. So he calls me one day. He says, got a whole roll of 32 or 30, whatever I mean, many is in one of those rolls of, of, of photographs of these, of these UFOs that I took over the base. So I went out, picked them up, took them over to our secure photo lab, gave them to our secure uh, developer and said, hey, develop these. And I, I, I stayed there, watched, you know, wait, wait. I said, I wanted some, some three by fives and, you know, eight by tens and whatever you can. So, you know, an hour later, however long it took, he comes out with him. He says, what the hell are these things? And they're oval shaped crafts flying above planes that were landing at. Now, Kirtland Air Force Base shares a field with Albuquerque International Airport. So planes coming in, these, these things would fly right over top of them and then veer off. Were and he, these uh, more like orbs or were they structured? No, they were structured. They were structured. And there were, I can't remember how many photographs there were, but there were, there were structured photo, there were structured crafts. And we had them blown up. I mean, these, the photo guys could do a lot. We had them blown up. I mean, whereby these crafts were about as big as the, the, the Corona crafts, and they were detail, exactly, or? oh, absolutely, details, um, uh, uh, struts, the, the, the bottom of it, well, there was one particular one, uh, and these were color photographs, showing a blue trail coming out of the bottom of the craft, which is probably the energy device. And we sent them all up to uh, headquarters, and I don't know whatever happened to them. Were they seamless? They were seamless, yeah. Seamless, yeah. And did uh, you know whatever happened to these photos, or were there any videos, or was all photographs? No, all photographs. He never did any videos. Okay. No, 
Now, he didn't do a video, but we had a video, we had a video that was brought to us at the base of this guy who um, was, uh, li lived in Placidas, north of uh, Albuquerque, lived in the mountains. He was retired Air Force, uh, I believe he was, he was a pilot. And he had a video camera setting up and he was watching animals. He lived in a remote area and deer and, and elk would come up to his back area. And he was, he was pretty much filming that. He was a wildlife uh, amateur photographer. But one day, uh, one night, uh, he heard a noise, went out, and this craft hovering right over his backyard. And he took a video of that. It was about 28 seconds or something like that before the craft took off. And that is the only video of a, of a legitimate video. We took the video, the camera, and everything because you always want to analyze all this stuff together. And we sent up to headquarters. They sent him a check back to pay for that camera because they were going to give him that camera back. And they were going to give him, and he wanted copies of that, but he never got that back. They classified it. Whatever happened to the stuff we sent up, I don't know. Where did you send it to specifically? He OSI headquarters. Oh, special yeah. investigation. Yeah, Air Force Officers of Investigation. At that, at that time, it was at Bowling Air Force Base, headquarters at Bowling. We sent it to headquarters at IVOE, which is the, uh, the counterintelligence uh, location, and then they, they would send it over to NSA. And the only reason I know that was years later, uh, after I retired, I was, um, I, I joined a, a, a pretty closely knit group of uh, former and retired intelligence officers. And we get together uh, every year. Uh, I haven't attended every single year, but out of 25 years, I probably attended 20 of these uh, uh, reunions or get togethers. And, and normally they're after or before the, the UFO convention at Laughlin. Well, it used to be at Laughlin, now it's at, uh, in Arizona. And we'd sit down and talk. We'd just sit down and talk about, in a secure, kind of a semi-secure place, and talk about what we know. And that's, that's why I learned a lot from them, because they were briefed in programs I wasn't bro, bro, briefed into. And one of the uh, uh, invest intelligence officers was from NSA. And when I first met him in probably 94, 95, and I had never met him before, I didn't know him before. He said, I always wanted to meet you because you and I were on the same case together. I said, what case? He said, Paul Benowitz. I said, what do you mean Paul Benowitz? He says, yeah, we interviewed him too. So they were investigating and we were investigating and we didn't know they were investigating. One particular night at Paul Benowitz's house, it was rainy night, winter, kind of fall. I was there and Jerry Miller was there and Paul was showing us different things. And Paul came to me and he said, you see that house across the street? The front of this house. I said, yeah. He said, you see those lights in that upstairs window? I said, yeah. He said, they're not supposed to be there. I said, what do you mean? He said, the house is vacant. I said, hmm. I said, I wonder who's over there. So I, you know, I got a gun and so I go down and I, I snoop around and I see the two vehicles parked hidden in the back yard. One's actually in a yard. So I get the license numbers off these vehicles. And the next, I, you know, I didn't want to go in. I figured, well, maybe they're buying a house or whatever. So the next day, I ran the plates, and they come back to a rental uh, uh, company out of, uh, Hertz, I think it was, out of Denver. And they were running on a government credit card. So I thought, okay, now, now go ahead. I don't know, a week or two weeks later, we were there at the same time, and we see these lights. Well, these lights are, you can tell, camera lights, the old red, red lights coming out, seeing that there, there's cameras pointed over here. I said, ah, I'm going to get them this time. So I call Albuquerque Police, contacts I had, tell them what I had, and tell them somebody come over there. And they come over, and we confront these two guys. And they, they, they had to tell us that they were uh, special agents and they, had, they rented this place. That's about all they said. said. So I knew... Did they say what agency? No, they didn't. And a APD was... I, mean, I was off base. I didn't have much jurisdiction there. So Albuquerque Police Department had to... You know, I was just relying on them. They ID'd them. It was confirmed that they rented a place. I was left at that. But this agent I met years later told me. He said, we investigated that one. We investigated the abduction up at uh, Springer, we, I didn't know this. 
So NSA was intimately involved in this stuff too. Do you know any other agencies or any of these other gentlemen you've met with? Uh, uh, DIA, of course, uh, CIA. Uh, we have uh, quite a few members uh, of the of our group uh, from the CIA. They weren't. Um, they didn't do any field work because the, the CIA couldn't do that. But they were relying on a lot of information that we were feeding them, and they were doing analytical uh, uh, studies of of what they had. And and um, but but and um, the FBI, of course, was involved in it. Well, the only uh, they had they found a <clears throat> a box, uh, a, a, a cylinder, I should say, not a box, a cylinder on the Ebing craft that had been uh, uh, analyzed at various locations, and Sandia had it. And in 1984, uh, 84, President Reagan came to Sandia and was going to be spe specifically briefed on this. And I happened to be part of the security detail. That I, and I was in the room when they were explaining this, this to him, and this cylinder had, and they had a, a I don't know, a, a electron microscope view of it, or however they, they figured out how to x-ray it or whatever they did to it, but they had cutouts of it and a presentation on, on the uh, on an overhead projector, and they were explaining to the president what, this, what they thought these things did, what this, and it was a multi-purpose avionics uh, uh, thing, uh, device, that uh, was also a, a navigation device for them. And, and so that's really the only uh, technology that I've ever learned or heard that Sandia was involved with. Do you know any further extent to which President Reagan was being uh, read into these various projects or information? Uh, I, I was told one of, one of our members uh, of our uh, former intelligence group uh, was a Secret Service agent. He was a Secret Service agent for some years and then he went over to the CIA. And uh, he, he told us that one of the most fascinating things about Reagan was he believed and he was briefed. He didn't see it or know it, but he knew of others, uh, Secret Service agents, that told him that when he took office on January whenever it was, of, of, yeah, 20th or whenever, of 81, he immediately asked for a briefing. Before the Iran, you know, we still had hostages in Iran. Before the Iranian, he even addressed that issue, he says, I want to be briefed on everything we have on UFOs. He sat in Oval Office and said that. And they said, yes, Mr. President, we'll, we'll do that. So he, he knew, he was never there when they were, he was briefed, but he knew of it. I went to uh, Washington to get a, a war, or award for something I did, which is still cl somewhat classified, and I met the president. I never talked to him about this subject, but he knew something because he said to me, I know you work on some very interesting things out there. And that's all I said. He didn't, we didn't go, in. I didn't have a whole lot of time. We're in of office for, you know, maybe two minutes or five minutes, whatever it was. And he gave me something, and he gave me presidential cufflinks. But just... And I knew that he, I knew what he was talking about. He never actually said anything, but I, I knew that he knew, which was nice because you recognize, you know, you think, wow, you know, what you're doing, what I'm doing out there is being briefed all the way up. There was a uh, UFO covered up, cover up live that was aired in October of 1988. Uh, I don't remember what channel, but, um, and a year before, in August of 87, um, myself, uh, Dr. Kit Green, Dr. Hal Putoff, um, Ernie Kellerstrauss, uh, Carl Dale, several of us, and, and Robert Collins, went to uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio, and had a meeting in a room. And this producer, who produced the UFO cover at Live, was there. And he wanted to interview us all, and most of, most of them said no. I said, well, what do you want to talk about? He said, I want to talk about, you know, this UFO thing. I said, I won't do it on camera. Well, we sat down in a room, you know, a room to, in a hotel room to do the interview. 
um, he interviewed me. Well, he gave me he gave me a list of questions first, and he said, "Read the you know, questions. Do you have any problems with any of those questions?" I said, "No, I don't have any problems with it." Well, yeah, I, actually, there were a few that I said I can't talk about this and this and this. I think three or four. Anyways, he interviews me. Uh, there was one cameraman and him, and he said he would turn the camera off and say, "Can you?" Can you actually elaborate more or can you, what he was trying to do was tell me what to say. And I told him right away, I'm not going to do play your games. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I know, what I did. I'm not going to tell you about anything else. I'm not going to tell you anything classified. I'm going to tell you about the Kirtland incident and about what I saw, but that's it. So he put me on back and maybe another five minutes, wasn't much more than that. And he started that again. I said, you know what? I'm terminating this. And I walked out of the room. Now, on the UFO Live, they have somebody that they claim to be me. And the beginning of it, the first probably 30 seconds, is in fact me. It, it, it blacked out. But everything else was dubbed in. Somebody else was talking <laughs> for me. And that really upset me. And, of course, then they say, well, you were live. You were there live. Impossible. I was going to the State Police Academy in Santa Fe during that time period. I started the State Police Academy in, in 1st of August and graduate until December. On that particular night, I was isolated inside that, that dormitory and, not, and not, not even able to watch, the, the, let alone being on it. So that was all a hoax. That was all made up. And uh, who dubbed for me? I think it was Robert Collins, to tell you the truth. But... Um, and I'm almost, almost positive that was him. And, and by the way, Robert Collins and I are not friends at all. Absolutely not friends. He published a book in 2006 with my name on it that I had absolutely no input into that book. Good enough. So, so people who say, well, you wrote, you wrote a book. I didn't write any book. I gave him information to put in the book. About 20% of what I gave him went into the book, and the rest of it never went into the book. And that book right now, I can see, I can, I'll, I'll swear to it that there's probably about 20% that are factual in that book. And there's probably 40 or 50% that's speculation. And then there's the rest of it is a absolutely a lies. They're hoaxes. I spent uh, a number of um, assignments to uh, Nevada. And I know that they were reverse engineering. I was never actually briefed on it. But... You know, common sense can tell me that this craft over here isn't something we made, or it's, it's based on something they designed. The only exception to that is the Cash Landrum incident in 1980. <clears throat> I know for a fact, I was involved in that. I know for a fact that that craft was piloted by Air Force pilots. It was based on a extraterrestrial craft that we'd had, and it was reverse engineered, but the the propulsion system uh, failed as a malfunction in some manner spurring uh, uh, spurring out uh, radioactivity and um, and I know that for a fact but that's the only that's the only uh, uh, reverse engineering other than the cylinder that uh, at, at Sandia uh, I understand that that was reversed engineered into the into uh, the 117 uh, I was at the uh, Nevada test site, which is now the National Security, Nevada National Security site, uh, what you call Area 51, which was at that time Debt 3 Test Center. It's Area 51, but it's, it was at that, when I was out there in the 80s, it was called Debt 3 Test Center out of Edwards. There was a detachment of a test uh, personnel from Edwards Air Force Base assigned to, to Area 51. And, you know, Area 51 is just a plot on the map based on the Nevada test site, all the different areas within that. So, but everybody calls it Groom Lake Complex. Or, actually, there's two different locations out there. There's the test site, there's the, the Debt 3 site, and then there's Groom Lake. That's two different sites. People are sometimes confusing it, thinking it's the same. And then Papoose is an auxiliary site that actually has the underground entrance. Mm -hmm. Have and, you been in that? <clears throat> absolutely, I've been through the whole, 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 whole site. Yep, I spent uh, nine months out there as a counterintelligence uh, officer. I, we had a, a facility at the uh, uh, Area 51 that would blind, we would shoot a laser up, 
and blind the Soviet satellites as they came over, blind their cameras so they couldn't photograph anything. And not only did we blind the Russians, we would blind anybody else's uh, satellites that would come over. So it's very difficult to get actually photographs uh, during that time period of Area 51. And now, I, I don't know that they have that out there anymore. I, I, you know, I've been gone out for a long time. What year was that? that you were? Uh, 80, 81. 81 and 85. And when was you were at that facility, did you see any man-made, uh, sort of based on reverse engineered objects? Yeah. That were used in what might be called electromagnetic robotics or anti-grav type systems? I saw one, uh, well, I would prefer, uh, nobody actually told me it was an anti-gravity craft, but the way it was operating and the way it was, it could lift up by itself, we watched it, it had to be. You know, I don't know what, what else, I'm not a technical guy, but I could, I could look at it and just common sense tells me this thing was anti-gravity. Now, but I think the craft, that craft was an actually alien craft. I don't think that was a reverse engineered. There's two different complexes out there. There's one that uh, I believe Lazar was talking about with, with the alien crafts. And then there's an entirely different area for the reverse engineering craft. They're not together at all. They're not in the same hangar. They're not next to each other. They're, they're in a different locations. The underground crafts, uh, the underground facility housed the extraterrestrial crafts. The above ground facilities in the far end of the, uh, the complex housed the reversed engineered aircraft. They had the bodies of all sorts of different types of crafts that they were manufacturing or testing that he put together and tried to fly it. Had a lot of crashes out there. So a lot of these things didn't work, but, 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 but they had those. But, but I know I read a book where it says everything was in one hangar and every, that's not true. They were all separated. And they had different people. It was compartmented. They had people over here dealing with that, those extraterrestrial crafts, and they had people over there that were de dealing with the reverse engineering craft. Now, the material, the information came through a third party, a bunch of people, scientists here, who would feed it out to there. Those people didn't have access to their, them, and they didn't have access to the other one. Were, did you ever see any of the ET craft when you were there in the underground? Yes. So, I saw two. The one that defied gravity, which I, no one ever told me it was an ET. What did it look you describe? It was an oval shape. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very big. It was probably uh, 10 feet by 20 feet. It was, wasn't very big. It had, um, I think, legs or, or landing gear that we had put on it. Um, because it, they didn't fit the, the, the structure of that craft. And it had these portholes that were um, almost fluid-like. You look at it and it looked like you're looking through water, if you know what I'm talking about. And um, I never saw the inside of it, but, but I only saw the outside. And I saw another craft, a huge craft, that was in the Papoose, uh, Papoose uh, complex. When you first go down into it, the first the Bay Area on the right-hand side, huge craft, probably 100 foot by 100 foot. I was never told what that was, but it looks like an older craft that had crashed and because there was damage on it, but the, the, the skin of it and everything looked strange. It didn't look like something we would, we would have built. Those are the only, the only ones that I could... And were there any uh, either living or deceased ETs? There? I never saw any. I saw a supposedly a closed circuit camera. Uh, I was sitting in a, in a building and it was a closed circuit camera filming one in another facility, but I never actually saw one face to face. The contractors, uh, E Systems, Johnson Systems, Sandia, Livermore, uh, Los Alamos, uh, Tektronics was out there, um, GE, uh, Motorola. Uh, Motorola had a huge facility where they were trying to um, check on their communications, how, how their communications worked. How the ET? Yeah, ET communications worked. Uh, those were the ones I, I, I can remember. 
Yeah, Eden Gigi ran the place, and 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 um, Gene Laskowski was the security uh, chief for EG and G, and he always calls himself the security officer for, but he wasn't the security officer. I always let him say that, but he he wasn't really a security officer, but he was their security officer, and he was briefed into a lot of things. He was he he, he knew a lot, a, as as Paul McGovern. I don't know if you know Paul McGovern, but Paul McGovern was the uh, the the site security chief for Area 51, for from uh, 70, I think 77 to 91. He's been, he was there the whole time. He's retired now. Lives in Washington, uh, Landover or Maryland, Landover, Maryland. I think I gave you his name to uh, somebody. I gave their names to try to contact him. He might mm -hmm. talk. Yeah, well. In in eighty nineteen eighty, I was at Wright Pat for a briefing on something entirely different. But while I was there, I asked to be briefed on 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 something uh, that was related to this, and I was taken over to a facility, an underground facility. It had a, you walk down steps, a ramp, and it was a huge underground facility. Although I didn't actually see it, I was told later, not by Collins, but by another person, Ernie Keller Strauss, that they had alien bodies down there. Now, I never saw them when I was there, and I was only there once at, at Wright Pat, down in that facility. So, what Collins talked about, those tunnel complexes, they probably are real. I mean, they probably had, had tunnels down there. And, and, and I was told that. In fact, I read something in a, in a classified uh, manual once, uh, a few years later, about it, about them. Yeah, they, right past, yeah, right past. Underground. Yeah, underground facility, yeah. You go in Pap Papoose, you go down the ramp, it's a circular, no, actually like a horseshoe. Uh, and then, and, and there's, there's uh, branches off each one of those, there's certain areas. It, it goes all the way around to the, the to the main containment area of of Area 51, okay. and it comes out on the the southeast corner of or the south excuse me southwest corner of of Area 51 near Hangar 7. It, it comes out of there, and but along the way there's elevators, and uh, there's compartmented shafts that if you don't have the right uh, uh, badge. You can't, and they're all exchange badge systems that you can't get in this, some of these. You only get into certain ones. Like I was saying before, if you're working on the alien craft, you're not going to be able. You're not going to be working on the other craft. So, the and, man yeah, the man-made crafts. Yeah. Have you been exposed, or did you come across in, in your career and your network um, the, the false INW or, or the deceptive indication and warnings projects related to this? Yes. And what did you find out about those? Um, that's pretty cla That's pretty hush. That's I, I don't think I should talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, when I briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, that was the main subject. That is, um, yeah, that's very uh, sensitive. Yeah, it's very, very sensitive. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. yeah. So we'll just pass that question on. Huh? That's fine. That's that perfect. The Soviets were just as um, curious about the phenomena as we were, and that one of the one of the uh, essential we call them uh, essential elements of information, which you ask a spy, so some things that the government says you have to ask these spies to get this information. One of the first things that the Soviets will, if if I'm trying to recruit you, and you're in, in the Air Force or the military, is what, what does the government know about UFOs? I want to know. We we want to know. KGB wants to know, and that that's something that's that's fascinating. And, and so when we recruit a, a, a Russian, we ask them the same thing, and then they tell us, "Oh, yeah, the KGB knows this." And, and so that's that's something that uh, is is was fascinating to me that the Russians were just as interested as we were, and probably just as involved. I was involved with the Germans on the subject uh, when I was stationed in Germany, uh, the, um, the BND, the, um, the German equivalent to the CIA, the BND, Bundesnachrichtendienst is, is what they call them in German. Uh, but 
only one particular incident that happened in um, around a nuclear weapon storage area where uh, something entered it, cut a fence, got in, didn't actually get into a bunker. Um, and uh, that's something that we briefed. And, but we, can never, we could never connect it, although there was a sighting of a UFO over it. But we could never connect them. That was the only interface I had with, uh, in, 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 with Germans. Well, I think the most convincing t case uh, that I've ever even been involved with has never ever been made public. And that was the incident up in uh, Utah uh, some years ago. There was, a, there was a guy that lived in a, a remote trailer just outside Dugway Proving Grounds. And he was a photographer. He'd worked as a, uh, he was in the Army as a photographer. And he retired from the Army. And he, and he went to work for, no, I'm sorry, he didn't retire from the Army. He just got out of the Army. And he went and worked for Dugway Proving Grounds as a photographer. He was never married. He was an orphan. He lived by himself in this uh, single wide, uh, probably 14 foot by 80 foot trailer. He had built some sheds and stuff around it. OSI at Hill Air Force Base uh, uh, called me and said, we got this guy in, that lives in this remote area up by Dugway that sent us all these photographs of UFOs. He said, and we don't really have anybody up here that's, and this is like 84, latter part of 84, or first part of 85. We don't have anybody up here that can really, you know, talk to this guy intelligently. Could you come up here? Because they didn't have a 9Q. A 9Q is a, is a OSI designation for somebody that, I, that investigated these things. So I went up there. I talked to my boss. He said, yeah, go up there, whatever you want to do. I went up there, flew up. We went out and visited this guy. This guy was not a very intelligent person. He had a lot of common sense, but not well educated. He uh, only went to eighth or ninth grade, but there wasn't anything he didn't know about cameras to take pictures. He learned this all on his own. I mean, the Army taught him, but then he, for years uh, at Dugway, he took pictures of, of things uh, out there. Uh, he showed us a book of all these photographs and these, and these creatures. And we were saying, where did you get these things from? He said, they land out here. He said, they land out here? I said, well, when did they? He said, oh, they left a long time ago, but they land. They come here and landed for years. I said, so I asked him to tell me the story. And he tells me that in 68, uh, the latter part of 68, he came home from work. It was a, it was a fall day. He goes in, uh, makes his meal. And all of a sudden, he hears some noises. He has, he has a cat that ran around crazy. And he goes outside, and he sees this craft landing in his backyard. And he went in and got his camera. Of course, being a photographer, went out and took pictures. And creatures came out. He took pictures of the creatures. And he has these pictures there. What did they look like? They looked, they looked exactly like the Ebens. Mm -hmm. They were Ebens. I mean, they never talked to him. But he said, well, they didn't talk to me with words, but he talked to me in my head. He said, I could understand then that they were having problems understanding me. And he gave him all these gifts that he had. And at, at first I thought this was a setup. Honest to God, when I got there, I thought this is, this is too real to be a, this can't be real. And I, t I tell the, the, the guy, the OSI agent from Hill, I said, Did you, is this a setup or something? Or this guy had movie props or this isn't, this isn't real. He said, why are you saying that? I said, because it's just, it looks too real to be real. He said, no, he said, this, I don't know. He said, we've never been out here. So he showed us everything. And the, 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 the contact lasted from about the 60s, late 60s, until about 75, 76. And then they told him they were leaving. And they gave him these gifts. And they're star-shaped. There's some of them that were like bronze statues and um, little models of things. And he said, they, they gave me, these are gifts they gave to me. I said, one of the questions I had, why are you telling us now? After all these years, you know, seven years or eight years, whatever it was, why are you telling us now? He says, I'm dying. This guy was a chain smoker. I bet you he smoked five packs of cigarettes a day. 
in an interview, he probably went through a carton. And, and, and he said, I'm dying. He said, I'm not going to live for another six, six months, but I got to do something with all this stuff. He said, and I figured it, you might as well have it. The Air Force might as well have it. So we sent the flag up, and then we got truckloads of people coming down, NSA, CIA, to review all this stuff. We actually had a, they contracted a company to come down with a moving van to move all this stuff, package it uh, in a unique manner because they don't know if this stuff would, is setting off a signal or, and I never thought of that until one of the technical people up in Santa Fe, or up the headquarters said, in Washington said, you know what? These things might be bugging, bugged or something or radioactive or, so they, anyway, they took it all up to headquarters and I don't know. How many objects eight, were there? Oh gosh, there were probably two dozen. Uh, I don't know exactly, probably at least two dozen. Some of them were just objects that you, they were made of, I don't know what material, but you couldn't really figure out what they were. I mean, obviously meant something to the Ebens because they gave them, you know, to, to him and thinking that it was something meaningful and um, so they packaged all that stuff up and took it to headquarters and I never heard more anything about it. And I've never read or seen anything on the internet about this case. Now, I think George Knapp has. I think somebody mentioned it to George Knapp some years ago. Art Bell sent me a letter once, uh, some time ago. And, and not a letter, I'm sorry, an email. And he asked me about the Utah case. And I'm not sure which, I sent him back saying, which Utah case? And he never responded to me, so. Do, do you know if this gentleman's name? Um, I th his first name was James, and he had a very funny last name. It's like a Polish name, Zadowski or Zadorowski or something like that. He was a, poor, a, a Polish origin. Um, I knew that. And, um, but he, had, he'd, he was originally from, he grew up in an in a orphanage in Northern California. But his, I guess his mother and father came to the West uh, from, they, they immigrated Poland to the United States and then they went West to California. And I don't know, somehow they died and he was three or four years old when, I don't remember how old he was. Do you, do you recall the, the, what these objects look like? I mean, just a few of them, the ones you uh, Some of them were shaped like a heart, a bronze heart with some um, um, calligraphy inside of it. And some of them were just statues of, almost like ceramic st statues of, of something, maybe a god or something. You, I, you couldn't ex really explain. They were small. Some of them were this big and some of them were real big. And, they, and there was a, another one they, they gave, uh, he had was a wreath, like almost like a wreath. And there were different symbols around this wreath. And in the back of it, they had these appendages that came out, uh, maybe to put it on a stand or something. I, 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 I could never figure it out, I'm sure. And I only saw them when the two times, one time that he showed them all to us, and then we, when we came back to package everything up, to send them up. So they're up in CIA or DIA or someplace be interesting to, yeah. I'm sure they've and been the analyzed. as well. Yeah. Were the photographs daytime of the craft? Or oh time? yeah, all of them were daytime that I can remember. And they were as, as clear as you can ever, and he was, he took pictures inside the craft. These are pictures in excited craft. What did those show? Uh, where they showed instrument panels, showed a screen, a huge screen uh, with uh, maybe the, the universe or star charts or navigational charts or something like that. And, and they and they told him they ha he had this he had this chart and this is a, we were leaving uh, the first time when he said oh I forgot to show you this. And he went into a, to a, a, a chest he had, and, it, and his house was a horribly maintained house. And he finds this, this it's like a, it's hard to explain it. It's like a, a laminated 
um, paper that has these lines through it. And he unfolded it. And he said, oh, this is where they came from. Well, there's no references on it. So you, you know, where, where is this? He doesn't, he didn't know. He said, but this is the chart they gave me. And that's the only thing that we actually took back that day with us. Mm -hmm. And then we, of course, came back later and get, get, get everything. And I don't know what they ever figured out. They don't ever tell us uh, much after that. Uh, it yeah, it goes up. up. Yeah, it goes up and never comes down. Did you ever hear where, uh, I mean, there's all the UFO lore, which I discount, but where some, some of these uh, ET species were from, what star systems? The only one that I know for a fact that I read later was Rated Reticuli. I don't Zeta. know. Zeta, I mean Zeta Reticuli, yeah, Zeta Reticuli. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a species from Yeah. Zeta. And that, that from was from an official source. Yeah, that was from official source. Now, there's a lot of uh, people within our, our, our retirement group, uh, a lot of speculation on different star systems and close star, star systems and things. But officially, that's the only one I know. Have you heard of any um, the projects that deal with ET simulations? Um, and what I'm referring to here, there, there have been some contact events. One you're referring to, I have sources, was actually not ET, but was, uh, if you will, a, a staged event by military or special operations to look ET because this woman had seen something classified. Have you, have you heard of those sort of operations? Yeah. <laughs> but um, well, I'm not sure the, if... The false I &W. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, we did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir that came out and did that. They uh, had these... Uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects, uh, antinomical defects that were uh, brought, brought in to, 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 to fool people and thinking they're aliens. Yeah. Um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still, the program is still classified and they're, they're probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt, doubt it, they were still doing it. Yes, I've interviewed a number of men in those special yeah. uh, operations programs. Yeah, there was a, there was a special uh, a highly classified operation that occurred uh, in, in Tacoma, uh, Washington, in um, I'm saying maybe 86 or 87, that was exactly, it was at the uh, uh, a naval base uh, in, uh, in Seattle. Um, I, I think it was Whidbey Island Naval Air Station, I think. Uh, but anyways, with Naval Air Station up there where uh, these civilians got onto the base uh, and, and got into something, and they, they, uh, they saw something they weren't supposed to see, and this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them. And, Staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. It's very sensitive, it's very sensitive, yeah. That and some of the other things that we did uh, in recruiting uh, people, um, we, uh, one of the things that you want to do to protect a base is recruit people outside the base to report into the base. So when I was at Kirtland, we had, not, I didn't do this, but we had a, a whole group of, 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 we call them swindlers, who could recruit anybody. And they went out and recruited primarily press people because they're the ones that are going to know first. So every news uh, agency, uh, every television, radio station in the Albuquerque or Santa Fe area had our snitches in there. So we knew, and we paid them. We paid them good money. One of the, good, one of the reasons you get the people is you pay them. And, uh, and that was controversial. That, that was somewhat controversial. You know of national media that have had Oh, similar? yes, yes, yeah. I'm not going to name them, but we had one. We had one out of, uh, or she... 
she was recruited uh, out of a, a local station here in Albuquerque, and then she went on to uh, a national uh, NBC, and and she was still. Um, she told us everything. She was. And we we didn't handle her. Somebody closer to, I think she would say out of Washington handled her, but she was. Uh, she would tell us things that were going to happen, and yeah, yeah. Were, were these also assets that could help stop stories from coming out? Yes. Yeah, and it wasn't just UFOs. Mm -hmm. It was anything that pertained to Air Force or military or the security of a base or, or spying or anything like that. Mm -hmm. If they heard something they thought would be interesting that we needed to know, they'd let us know. And the other way around, that they would help, uh, yeah. you had people who could help stop it from being broadcast. Yes, 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 yep. Yeah, the high-level producers and directors yeah. And were they, how were they paid so that it wasn't? Cash. Yeah, you pay. What you do is you make them sign a form and you tell them, you got to report this to the IRS. But whether they do it or not, you, you know, you're, you're not going to give your form to IRS. But, you, but you're supposed to tell them that. There's a form that they, they sign and you give them, I think it's anything over, was everything over $50 they had to sign for. We always had money. We, uh, if we needed to do something, we had money. We had, there was different funding. Uh, we call them funding sites. If you were if you were doing an operation, a counterintelligence operation, and you needed, you know, five thousand dollars for this, then they would give us a number. Okay, it's under this site, and somebody would deposit it in a, a bank here, and, and we would use that money, or they would give us vouchers or what, what, something to that effect. But there would be different uh, funding sources. I, I'm not sure where they came from. I'm sure all government funding someplace up there. Congress appropriates the funds, and there's a lot of black projects and black funding, so I'm sure we got a piece of that. So I was uh, just getting ready to ask you about Bechtel Corporation, the, or the involvement you had with them, or their involvement with this subject. Bechtel was in charge of uh, security and operations at a number of facilities, including the Nevada test site, and um, one of their uh, uh, chief uh, in, in, uh, security officers was a former colleague of mine who worked at Kirtland with me. And um, uh, Bechtel, there was a lot of uh, experiments done in uh, at the Nevada test site, which is, of course, now the Nash Nevada National Security Site, uh, regarding you know, for research of alien uh, tech reverse engineering. Well, they were trying to, uh, I think Sandia Labs had a project, uh, uh, had, a, had funding uh, to, 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 to delve into this time travel, whether you could go back in time or forward in time. And they built facilities out there to, to test different things, huge magnets. I think they had one of the world, underground, uh, underground magnets, and they were shooting lasers and things through them, trying to uh, open up a fabric of space in order to, to do time travel. And I, I, was, I watched a, a number of those things. I was briefed on a, a counterintelligence project out there, but I don't know whatever the outcome of it was. I don't know if they ever figured it out or not. How Red about any uh, experiments did you hear of or come across experiments dealing with so-called teleportation or moving across space in a nonlinear way? Th that was part of, of uh, this this project that they were doing out there, they would, they would, they actually, I think, teleported something from one end of a table to the other. I think that's the best they ever did. But uh, and, and maybe they, that's all I know. Maybe they did more that I, I was just, I wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. But you had knowledge of that. Yes, I did. Yeah. I actually saw a craft flying above uh, Groom Lake that uh, did things that. Um, you couldn't do with a, a conventional aircraft. Uh, speeding, going uh, 1,400 miles an hour and stopping and changing angles, and then going straight up and stopping and coming back down. And this is a big aircraft. This, is a, this was one of these, these oval-shaped alien crafts that they were testing out there. And, and this is an 87. I, I don't, you know, I, you can look at it and you could just tell, but just a conventionally, uh, you know, because common sense tells you that how do they do this stuff? It can't be a conventional craft. They can't use conventional means to do this. It has to be anti-gravity or something. To, 
because it would kill a pilot. I mean, I, should, I, I had a pilot standing next to me who had been a, 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 a fighter pilot for years, flew F-106s, and he told me there's no way in the world a pilot could have survived that. The G-forces. The G-forces, yeah. And stopping. He said, accelerating isn't bad, but you got to stop. When you stop, it's going to break your body to pieces. Oh, yeah. Your, yeah. Nose will, your brains will come out of your nose. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know this. So, so that's one of the weird things uh, I saw that just not explainable. I can't f figure out it. Were there know. human pilots on board? Or were I never saw it land, so I don't know. I, I don't Did know you ever meet an Air Force pilot who piloted them? Only the, one, only the cash lander. Mm -hmm. I actually interviewed him. Oh, or, there were four of them. I mean, there was two, there was two, fi the two pilots. There was a, um, uh, a systems officer that was handling the, the equipment. And then there was a, uh, I can't remember what the fourth person did. He was a navigator or what he was. And um, I, I, I interviewed them. And, and everything that could have gone wrong, it took off fine from Nevada and flew perfectly. But when they... It was it was going to um, an air base. I can't remember which air base it was. Some some air base in Texas. I think it was Webb Air Force Base in Big Springs. I think it was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Webb. And when they tried to slow it down, that's when the problems happened. And then they cut power, and so many things went wrong that uh, they almost crashed. They called for rescue helicopters, they thought, they thought we were going to crash. So these helicopters came out, but they finally got it going again, and they landed at some place. Apparently it was just past where they spurred all this radiation on those two poor people, or three people, or however many it were. And then they, then they flew it back to uh, Nevada. It was pretty huge. It was a, uh, one of those big ones. It was, a, uh, it was uh, not uh, a saucer shape. It was more of huge oval shape was it and it was it was it was reverse engineered, reverse engineered. Yeah. Yes. they trained nine months before they ever flew it and then they trained another uh, i can't remember how long four or five months flying it all around nevada and it worked fine but the problem is it's a it's a reverse engineered alien craft with a one of our nuclear propulsion systems mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't refined because they couldn't figure out how to reverse engineer the aliens. They, they got it to work at times, but they couldn't manipulate it the way they, they needed to for a human pilot to fly it. So they had to put one of our uh, propulsion system in it, and it, you know, it malfunctioned. And they, and they trained, and there wasn't any, any the pilot told me, they were flying, and everything seemed, they were flying at a high altitude, I can't remember what altitude it was, flying perfectly fine, no problems whatsoever, until they slowed down. He said, and then, oh, hell broke loose. And then the system just malfunctioned, and they had this, uh, some something that was supposed to throw thrust, but the, the thruster was moving all around, and, and they had a filter, some kind of filter that was filtering, supposed to filter, that didn't work, that didn't come down, and it was just a mess. Do you know what kind of velocities this craft reached? Uh, it could go uh, Mach 1. Okay. And I, 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 that's all I was told, I mean, maybe probably more than that, but uh, just what he told me, what the pilot told me when I interviewed him was, he, he, he had it up to Mach 1. So it sounds like a hybrid craft. It had some aspects of the ET craft and others yeah. of a conventional. Uh, yeah, the body and everything was ET. The only thing that was propulsion was our. It was us. It was American and and or, or, or conventional or actually a nuclear, uh, and it just didn't work. And there were four humans. Yeah, four four humans in it, and none of them suffered any radiation problems. It's just those poor people on the ground. I really want to thank you. You're welcome. For great information. You're very welcome. I really appreciate your help.